Okay, so welcome to your next pre-recorded lecture. Uh, don't worry, we are not going to even attempt to use WebCampus's native media client again because that was a disaster and I think it's the second time we've had a problem. So we're just going to move forward with this workaround from here on out. Um, so we're jumping in today to cultures of movement. So we, we started by looking way back into antiquity and we talked a little bit about human evolution. And so we're going to think a little bit on that scale, but we're going to also think about how movement is an integral part of human culture even today. Uh, as has been the case so far, there is a content warning on this lecture. We will discuss some historical trauma and some of the photos in this uh, lecture might be disturbing, so please be aware and make sure that you do what you need to take care of yourself. Um, now, let's move forward. So I like this infographic from the National Geographic because it adds something to our understanding of the history of human migration. So we saw a map last time and we're going to look at that um, again. It's a similar map. And one of the things that this map does that others don't is that it uses color to show changes over time. And I'm pretty sure that this color scheme is also colorblind approved, but it might not be. So if anybody can't quite see the color scale, please let me know and I'll provide an alternate format or alt text. Um, the key thing to note about this graph is that not all humans really came from the same place. They don't originate in, in exactly the same area. And you'll probably recall that from our uh, look at evolutionary human history, right? Up here in Europe, there were Neanderthals. And over here, there was Denisovan or human, uh, not human, <laughs> Homo floriensis, some, some uh, Homo erectus. Right, and then in here is really where we saw a lot of Homo sapiens. And then we saw them kind of intermingle here and uh, over here in, in Eastern Asia and, and move forward. So this map doesn't really show us the diversity of peoples that we saw in some of our previous maps. Uh, but what we see instead is change over time. So we see this origin of human existence as we understand it today here in Central Africa. And then we see how shortly thereafter, uh, humans had migrated, hominids had migrated from that place of origin uh, all over the continent of Africa and across into uh, Eastern, not Eastern, I'm sorry, Western Asia, uh, and, and even across the sort of the southern parts of Asia. And if we think back this far, we might think about uh, ice ages and, and glaciers and ice caps, right? Kind of occupying a large portion of, of the northern regions of land masses. So don't forget that climate plays a role in the spatial arrangement that we see here. Um, but one of the other things that's really interesting is that uh, we don't really see a lot of movement into uh, Europe and in conjunction with Neanderthals until 45 to 35,000 years ago. So relative to this time scale, right, that goes back to 200,000 years, that's, that's pretty recent, right? That's the re most recent quarter. And what's interesting is if we look at other things that were happening at the same time, we see this migration up along the uh, eastern coast of Asia and down into Australia. And I think this is really significant because um, Aboriginal Australian culture has long made the claim that they are the longest continuous culture uh, existing on Earth today. And for many, many years, that, that claim was dismissed, uh, which, which is perhaps unsurprising in a colonial society, um, as Australia is an extension of the British Empire. Uh, but it's actually turning out that the science really supports that claim. And now the archaeological and the geological record is like, oh, well, maybe, maybe there is something to it. Maybe, maybe they were right all along. Um, 
that's an issue that we're going to come back to and we're going to revisit specifically uh, this week, not just in this lecture, but also in your reading. So I'm going to move forward. Uh, but so Austronesian culture uh, is one of the oldest continuous cultures that is on earth and it is not a culture that is invested in the same kinds of I'm going to use this word loosely, civilization that we've come to value in the way that we teach human histories. So more about that in a moment, but I do want to make sure that I talk about this movement here and its temporal coding, right? We're going to talk more about the Bering Strait situation, uh, and that was discussed in Pleistocene Wars, and we're going to come back to it in the reading this week. Um, but one of the things that is really not, not as helpful about this graphic is it doesn't give us a clear sense of how contested this date is. There are archaeologists at UNR who are working in here in this area and are making the claim that there are many older remains of human cultures here in Nevada than this theory, the Bering Strait, the land bridge theory, would allow us to think. So if you'll think back to Charles Mann, 1491, in that chapter that we read, The Pleistocene Wars, we're going to think more about how the scientific evidence stacks up in the way that we determine whether or not a theory holds weight. Uh, the last thing I do want to point out before we move on to the next slide is this later wave of migration, which was still quite a long time ago. I think that says 2,500 years. It's hard for me to see at this, at this uh, size. Um, but this is when we get a second wave of uh, oceanic migration. And I think this is an important thing for us. Oh, here, look, we have a nice marker here. Um, this is an important thing for us to acknowledge, particularly because one of the culture groups that is uh, one of the groups they're working on oceanic culture or Oceania. And we notice that we have a couple of waves of migration. We have one of the oldest waves of migration uh, in the 50,000 year range that brought peoples down across Southeast Asia and through these archipelagos to Australia and Tasmania, which was accessible at the time. And then uh, a little bit later on, you had a second wave of migration that came down uh, from essentially what is now China and the island of Taiwan, and then it came out and populated Melanesia and then Polynesia, and then the Polynesian culture, which is all over here, uh, became its own culture of migration. So we're going to come back to that in just a moment. Um, but here's a different view of the same thing. And you'll notice last graph gave us time. This graph does try to give us time, but not with color, right? So it just gives us date markings. Um, and what it gives us with color instead is an acknowledgement of the other hominid species that were in these areas when Homo sapiens encountered them, right? So we do have evidence. So the oldest, oldest home of Homo sapiens is the southern and eastern half of the African continent. But that doesn't mean they were the only occupants, right? So we had Homo erectus in these bright yellow spaces, and we had Homo neanderthalis in these sort of mustard colored spaces. And as Homo sapiens moved out of their areas of origin, they encountered these other hominid species with whom they could interbreed. That sounds like such an animalistic way to say that. Um, but intermarry is maybe a little too social. So. Uh, with whom they reproduced, <laughs> formed kinship groups, and uh, created families. So same map of movement, although we do see that the movements that went on in here are not as well represented, even though they would be taking, taking place on the same, same time scale as these movements here into the North American Arctic. So two, two different views of the same information but the way that we parse the information matters. So moving forward, I want to pause to acknowledge that 
the unified history of human migration, that we all come from the same place. And not only do we all come from the same place, but that we that people got to North America specifically through one route at one time that can be explained in one way that is not necessarily uh, what we what is widely accepted by everyone. Let's put it that way. So our reading this week is going to be a chapter from uh, Vine Deloria's um, Red Skin, White Lies. And it's a critique of the way that science is not only um, conducted, especially on subjects that will overlap with indigenous concerns, but the way that that science is used. So Vine Deloria is actually one of the most well-respected Native American scholars uh, in the 20th from the 20th century. He's written a lot, a lot of books that are um, very well received and award-winning. He's also a legal scholar, so he works a lot on indigenous law and the history of treaties with the United States. So he really comes at this from a very interesting angle. And in the chapter that we're going to read, he critiques the Bering Strait theory. I'm not going to get into his critique too much because I want you to do that. Um, but one of the things that's really important about Vine Deloria's critique is that the contrast between what science turns up uh, and what indigenous cultures say about their own origins, that tension almost always resolves in favor of the Western knowledge system or science, right? There tends to be this, um, well, maybe we should just say there is a tendency for scientific knowledge to completely dismiss indigenous knowledge and practices until science is able to prove to themselves, I guess, that there might be some merit in the indigenous knowledge practices. And we've already seen in previous lectures that there have been ways in which indigenous knowledges and indigenous practices actually knew more than Western science did at the time. And it took Western science some time to catch up. So one of the things we want to be aware of is not only that there are other perspectives, but that there are other ways of creating and storing and transmitting knowledge in other cultures that may be just as valid as the, the systems of knowledge production that are most familiar to us, right? Um, and one of the things that's really important about what Deloria uh, critiques is not just how we produce knowledge, but what we do with it. So he's going to talk specifically in this chapter about how scientific th theories about the migration of humans to North and South America, to the Western Hemisphere, how that ends up getting weaponized and used against indigenous peoples, even today in contemporary legal settings. So that's a really important part of this critique. And I want to make sure that as we discuss the fact that this is the prevailing theory in science, there are indigenous critiques of this theory and they're not all evidence-based so this brings me to a key point when we're thinking about how we uh, analyze not analyze assess the validity of the knowledge that we're accessing in order to learn about cultures that aren't aren't our own right um, this phrase, nothing about us without us, actually comes from di disability activists. Um, in, the, in the mid 90s, disability activists uh, succeeded in getting the Americans with Disabilities Act passed. And one of the rallying cries for their activist movement was nothing about us without us, because they were so dehumanized and infantilized that people who were making laws and decisions about their bodies and about their persons were doing so under the assumption that they were incapable of making their own choices and therefore needed somebody else to have guardianship. So there was a literal belief that if someone had a, a physical disability, right, like they, they were unable to walk and needed to use a wheelchair, that somehow that precluded them from having an opinion about how they should be treated as human beings. Um, 
that's a that's a related activist movement. But one of the things I think is so valuable about the success of their movement was the idea of nothing about us without us. And that's something that we can take and we can apply to our own work investigating uh, other cultures and understanding other cultures and the way that knowledge systems work. So when we're doing our research projects like the culture map, we want to consider whether or not the sources that we have looked into, that we have used to come to our conclusions, um, do they include the cultures or <coughs> excuse me, people who belong to the cultures that we're investigating? Uh, right, so this, this slide specifically is to give us a moment to pause and ask ourselves this question, right? Have we included uh, anyone, any perspectives from the culture we're studying? Uh, or in the case of ancient cultures where, where nobody's dead or everybody's dead, um, have we included any of the voices of descendants of that culture? Um, so have we included perspectives that might help us to understand that culture on its own terms. And this is really important because colonialism doesn't just come from literal people entering a space and violently taking over land or resources. Colonialism also happens with knowledge practices. So having Western white people come into an indigenous or non-Western space and then tell them the truth about themselves is also a colonialist act. We might be able to understand that that's a colonialist act when we think about the Spanish Mission Project in California, in which Spanish friars set up missions, uh, and in the process, they enslaved indigenous people, told them their culture was inferior, and insisted that the real truth about the world was their Catholic perspective with their Catholic religious beliefs uh, and their Catholic God. Uh, so if we can recognize that that is a colonialist mechanism, then we should also be able to recognize that having scientists come into non-Western spaces and tell the indigenous people there how to understand themselves is also introducing a power dynamic into the knowledge between the indigenous culture and the Western culture. So that's kind of our setup. Uh, I want to make sure that we also acknowledge that migration or movement of peoples and cultures is not always the same as colonialism, right? So migration, let's talk first about migration. Migration is for the purposes of needs fulfillment. Migration can be seasonal. It can be cyclical. Um, so not just seasonal, which would be a one-year cycle, but it can be cyclical uh, over multiple years, or it can be a permanent relocation. Um, when, you, when existing people, uh, when, sorry, when migrating people encounter existing people in new places, migration requires learning to live with or alongside that region's initial inhabitants, the people who are already there. Uh, this may lead to conflict between the peoples who have newly arrived versus the people who have already been there. Uh, we can actually see that in um, say the origin myths of the, the Washishu people who actually, that's, that's who's pictured here. Um, the Washishu people who are the oldest known inhabitants of the Washoe and Tahoe area. And their origin myth is Washoe people are grown, in which they are grown from this land uh, and, and collected by the, the Earth Mother figure and, and planted here. Uh, the Paiute origin myth is actually a story of Stone Mother, who sits at Pyramid Lake to this day. And Stone Mother came to this area from the south. Uh, which is actually in line with linguistic evidence of what we know about the Paiutes um, or uh, the Kui Ui ka uh, Kakado, as they call themselves, the Kui Ui Eaters. Um, those are the, the trout that swim uh, between Pyramid and Tahoe along the Truckee. Uh, so 
the the Paiute speak a language that's part of the Uto Aztecan family, uh, and neither Ute nor Aztec nor Paiute are the names that the people use for themselves. Uh, but the Uto Aztecan family would suggest to us that the Paiute people are somehow connected to people from central Mexico who migrated northwards. And indeed, in her, in the myth of the Stone Mother, Stone Mother herself comes from another area from the south and, and then establishes at Pyramid Lake. Um, in fact, Pyramid Lake is her tears. Uh, so it's important that we acknowledge that the conflict between people who are already here, like the Washoe and the Paiute, who then came in later, that conflict always happens. And it did happen. There was um, conflict between the Washo, the Washishu and the Paiute. But conflict is not the same as conquest. So colonization is, by its nature, violence right, is not migration. So there are two different kinds, well, there's really more than two different kinds of, of colonialism, but we're going to talk specifically about two. So settler colonialism displaces an original population and usually relies on politics of forced relocation or extermination, right? Colonization is for the purposes of accumulation. And in the case of settler colonialism, in order to make space for the settlers, the indigenous inhabitants must be removed or killed. In exploitation colonialism, the indigenous population are instead, instead enslaved or exploited uh, in order to extract resources for the benefit of the metropolitan power. So this is more along the lines of other parts of uh, the British Empire, where the upper echelons of a ruling class came from Britain, exerted their influence and power over the economic circumstances of, say, India or Australia uh, or other parts of the world, Canada. And then their relationship to the indigenous people is to leave them where they are to do the hard work that the colonial power wants to take advantage of. Right. So this uses fewer people, people, fewer of the colonizing people to impose a foreign rule on the existing people instead of displace them. So what we have in the U.S. is settler colonialism. What we have in, say, uh, what we had in British India is more of an exploitation colonialism. Uh, so acknowledging that there's a difference between migration and colonialism, let's turn to uh <clears throat> let's turn to some cultures of movement and talk a little bit about what it means to think about movement as an essential human cultural behavior. Um, next week, we're going to talk about settlement and agriculture as an essential human behavior. But I think it's important that we start with the idea of movement, excuse me, because one of the things that we considered when we asked ourselves where to begin with this course um, is that we considered the possibility of starting with civilization, with agriculture, with the establishment of permanent settlements. And we might wonder why. Why should that be the origin of the narrative that we are attempting to uncover? It might partly be because we're already invested in a culture of settlement. Uh, we participate in a culture that believes in things like private property and that settles folks in one location. And we tend to ignore or erase in the histories we tell the cultures of movement that don't leave the same marks on the land that the cultures of settlement left. So. Polynesian culture and um, Oceania more broadly are an excellent example of ancient, technologically advanced cultures, but cultures that did not leave intensive permanent marks on their landscape, right? So it's interesting to have a look at the migration of uh, Oceania. We talked a little bit already about arrival in Australia um, and then this second later wave of migration. So here at the sort of nexus of Melanesia and Micronesia uh, and these sort of 
Austronesian areas here, like where they all intersect. This is where the migration into Melanesia and Polynesia really begins. And that comes a little bit later. So we've gone from, you know, tens of thousands of years with this migration to just two thousand years uh, BC or BCE before the common era. So we're going to look at graphs and they're going to say BC and AD. That means before Christ and Anno Domini, which is the year of our Lord. Um, but a less uh, religiously inflected way to say the same thing is BCE before the common era and CE common era. So dates are the same. They mean the same thing. We just take the like Christ part out of it um, because that is not an orienting moment for everyone in our country or culture. <laughs> Boy, we should talk about Bede. He's the one who calculated the date of the birth of Christ. Um, but that is a total tangent uh, that I could definitely get stuck on. So back to Polynesia. One of the interesting things about Polynesia is that there is a cusp here right around about a millennium before the common era where Fiji and Samoa are some of the older parts of this culture. And then there is just movement, movement, movement. There seems to be consistent movement throughout time. And one of the reasons that this is possible is because Polynesians in particular, right, who are the people who essentially they, they migrated from this nexus um, and, and they island hopped from these close islands in Melanesia to these slightly farther apart islands. And then suddenly right in here, long voyages became not just possible, but standard long sea voyages. And uh, in particular, with navigation that allowed people to find their way, not just to these areas, but back from them. Uh, this is a reconstruction of one of the double hulled canoes that Polynesian wayfinders would use. And this is an Aboriginal Polynesian father teaching his son traditional wayfinding techniques. Um, so this culture continues to this day in a lot of ways that are similar. And I think it's worth talking about why this culture continues in the way that it does. So if you have a look at our earlier map, remember I, I pointed out that uh, there's a lot sort of missing in here on this map. Uh, it's worth talking about the fact that environment shapes our societies right? There's going to be a different kind of society that develops here in the Indus Valley, uh, Indus River Valley, uh, versus one that develops here in the middle of a continent versus one that develops here with the ocean to connect it, right? It's easy, especially looking at a map like this, to think that these are, these islands are very, very isolated, right? They're very far apart. And yet we know that Polynesian culture went back and forth between all of these places, right? So this map literally leads us to believe that this is a nothing, a no space. Um, but what we can clearly see from multiple different kinds of evidence, and here I've just used two uh, or maps that, that pointed to, we know that Polynesian wayfinders found themselves all over the, the multiple islands in this region and not only did they do that, but they also found their way back. And it's not totally clear how these uh, sort of cultural minglings happened, but one of the things that we know for sure, um, so here at, um, so here at Rapa Nui, uh, but we think projecting farther back to the Marquesas Islands, uh, we know for sure that there is DNA in folks who were he were at Rapa Nui at in the 14th century, and their DNA reflects both Polynesian ancestry and Colombian, right? Uh, and that that of course in the 14th century would be indigenous uh, Colombian and and uh, probably Andean cultures, right? Um, actually up in Colombia that might be more Amazonian. So 
we know from human ancestry and human DNA that there was intermingling between Polynesians and people in this northern part of uh, South America. We know from sweet potato DNA, and man, I'm telling you, the, the DNA studies on people, humans, or sorry, humans, insects, plants, it, it's really wild. Uh, and they all tell a slightly different story. And so I'll give you an example here is that we have these Polynesian voyages. It appears that they did in fact come to South America, but the DNA that we thought uh, that we saw in humans came from Colombia. And so that is not a direct match with the sweet potato DNA, but we did see it in Hawaii, but Hawaii was not reached by the Polynesians until much later. Uh, and then what we also see if we, if we use our map key, um, we see the movement of sweet potato DNA from other parts of South America along the Andean coast um, of what is now uh, sort of Peru and Ecuador. These areas also sent sweet potatoes. So sweet potatoes came from South America and then migrated through Oceania back to mainland Asia. Right. And this is all happening as Polynesians are sailing through. I'm going to go back to the last map. This no place. So it's worth thinking about cultures of movement as key makers of human connection. And especially when we look at, sorry, when we look at Polynesian culture, one of the things that's really important about the way that they view their environment and the way that they have, the way that they have built life in this environment is to view movement and connection via the sea as essential to their survival, right? So instead of agriculture, they live in a tropical or temperate environment where things grow, environments provide food, but islands have a maximum population capacity. And so the provision for the culture is to move and find new islands rather than set up a settlement and stay and grow that settlement. And so this, the structure of a Polynesian or a pan-oceanic culture is entirely different than what we would see in a civilization that founds itself in a river valley and builds up over time. Totally different course of history. Uh, so I do want to pause to talk about the importance of maps, right? What's at the center of our maps matters. What we, where we place things and the spatial relationships that we give to the information that we are displaying dis displays a lot about our assumptions and our worldview. So in particular, this is a, uh, it's actually a map from the game Risk. And uh, it shows a standard Mercator proje projection of the land masses. And this map actually became famous because it's missing something. <laughs> New Zealand. <laughs> New Zealand just didn't make it on this map. In fact, there's an entire subthread on social media and Reddit about uh, New Zealand being left off of maps. And it's worth pausing to think about what else is left off of this map not just New Zealand, which is importantly Maori and part of Polynesian culture, uh, but the entirety of Polynesia doesn't make it on this map. So what we put in the center of a map really matters. When we display the world this way, we cut out a major ocean and a major center of, of an entire culture right? It's easy to think that there's nothing here. And when you're this zoomed out from the perspective, then it looks like it. But if you zoom in a little bit, you can see that there's actually quite a lot here. It's just connected by ocean instead of by land. And ocean, importantly, becomes a barrier to land-based societies, but it is the means of transportation to to cultures of movement. So, sorry, I'm just checking Discord to make sure nobody's asking for help. <laughs> um, so as we look uh, at these, these perspectives on cultures, we have to think about the process of diaspora, 
So if you're not familiar with that term, it refers to people living outside their homelands. So in the case of Polynesian culture, um, Pacific Islanders in particular continue to live a lifestyle of diaspora. Um, so this graph actually just shows native Hawaiians in the United States. Uh, native Hawaiians are uh, racially and ethnically Polyn uh, not Polynesian, uh, Pacific Islanders and, and part of a broader pan-Polynesian culture. And even just within the United States, there are almost as many native Hawaiians living in mainland US as there are living in Hawaii itself. Uh, and this is important because as part of a culture of movement, they have a different relationship to their homeland than cultures of land, right? So the, the folks from this culture continue to maintain their ways of life even as they move around the world, even as they move to the, into mainland US and live in California, Washington, Nevada, uh, right? Even as they live in these other spaces, they continue to maintain their connection to their culture because their culture is one of movement, movement of away and return. Uh, there's another form of diaspora that we do not have to take the time to acknowledge. I have a lot of slides on this, but I'm going to move through them pretty quickly. Uh, the slides are available in the files for the course, so don't sweat it if you want to go back and have a look. But diaspora can also be caused by forced relocation. Uh, and there are a number of instances of this, and this is the part where you may need to um, take some time, take a breath. There's historical trauma discussed of multiple racial and ethnic groups. What you see pictured here is a Cherokee artist's rendition of the Trail of Tears or the forced removal of the Cherokees from what is now the southeastern United States to Oklahoma. Um, Jewish diaspora has been a constant cycle of Jewish existence almost since Jews were an independent group. Um, actually, at the time, they would have called themselves Israelites. Um, but they have gone through, uh, excuse me, throughout their history, they have gone through a number of exiles and returns, diaspora and return. So early in early Israel, uh, there are two different exiles. There's the exile to Egypt, and that's where you get the story of Moses and the Exodus. Um, and then there's the later exile into uh, the Babylonian Empire, and that's when Israel stopped to essentially be uh, an exclusively Jewish space. Uh, once Persia, we're going to get into this when we get into the history of the Jews. So this is the quick and dirty. Once Cyrus overthrew the Babylonian Empire, uh, I think of Nebuchadnezzar, don't, don't quote me on that. We're not there yet. Anyway, Cyrus gave the Jews permission to return to Jerusalem, but at that point, not everybody did. Um, oh, and Israel had already split into two and half of them had already been uh, exiled under the Assyrian Empire several decades, maybe even a century earlier. Um, got to look at my notes for that. <laughs> anyway, the key point here is exile return, exile partial return. Some Jews decided to stay in Babylon because that became a major center of Jewish learning and there was nothing in Jerusalem for them to return to. So you have two different cultures and two different groups living in two different places that still identify as a part of the same culture. Uh, they do return and then under succeeding emperors uh, they also end up being exiled or they end up moving of their own accord so after the conquest of alexander the great that created hellenism don't sweat this we are gonna talk about uh classical empires anyway alexander the great created this like mixing pot along the Eastern Mediterranean, in which Jews moved out of Israel and into these other spaces that were suddenly accessible and safe for them because they weren't exclusively, um, Hellenistic culture was not exclusively Greek. It is actually really capacious and uh, incorporated lots of different cultures. And then, of course, there was the Roman Empire. They were not so inclusive. And when the Jews didn't like what Rome was doing so much and they rebelled. Eventually the Romans uh, took down the rebuilt temple. So it was the Babylonians who destroyed it in the first place. 
Um, and then they rebuilt it. And then the Romans were like, ah, no, no, y'all trouble, y'all are troublemakers. Like, get rid of it. And they removed a lot of Jews by forced relocation. So even in antiquity, Jewish diaspora had happened throughout the Mediterranean and the Near East. Um, during the Roman Empire, that diaspora extended because Jews really had the, the ability to travel anywhere within the Roman Empire, not necessarily in the unharassed, we'll put it. Um, they were still marked by their otherness, uh, and yet they still had this kind of ability to move about and make their homes elsewhere in the Roman Empire. In the Middle Ages, that got a lot more complicated. We're not going to go over this map in detail. You have uh, you have the opportunity to peruse it at leisure if you look at the slides. But the key thing here is that you had a lot of migration, especially once Rome doesn't exist anymore. All of this land down here is actually from like here, here down. This is all belonging to Islamic powers. And so you have migration of Jewish folks across and within Islamic powers. And sometimes they would migrate from Islamic nations into Christian nations. Um, and sometimes they would get kicked out, right? So expulsion was a normal part of Jewish existence, especially in the Christian Europe of the Middle Ages. Um, at some point, Christian cultures would just decide that Jews were really bad. And instead of persecuting them, they would uh, commit pogroms, which were expulsion on pain of extermination. So if you didn't leave, you died. Um, Jewish diaspora continues to this day. Uh, so during the Second World War, there was mass migration of Jews out of Europe in an attempt to get away from Hitler. Uh, not everybody succeeded, as you well know. And then after the end of the war, there was migration towards Israel once the state of Israel was recreated out of the British protectorate of Jordan. That's not the only diaspora that comes from a painful history, though. Uh, the African diaspora, which was entirely created by the transatlantic slave trade, is essentially the, the existence of people of African origins in North America, North and South America, and throughout the Caribbean. And one of the crucial things about the African diaspora is that it included a loss of cultural ties in the way that Jews did not experience. There was a certain uh, unity around Jewish identity that allowed them to hang on to their culture, partly because it was connected to their uh, understanding of their ethnicity as well as their religion. Uh, African diaspora went very differently because there were many different peoples from all over Africa who were reduced essentially to all being the same kind of chattel, which literally means property. And in the process, they were removed from their cultures of origin and forbidden from practicing it. And many people who are part of the African diaspora today do not know where their ancestors come from. And that is a particularly painful part of their experience of diaspora. Okay, so the last segment of this lecture is really gonna turn to migration as a way of life. So existence sometimes requires movement. And if we look at the animal world, we can see that that is true for a lot of species. There's a lot of movement of species across continents even. Um, seasonal movements, multi-year cycles, mating cycles. There's a whole lot of movement that goes on in the animal world. And so it's interesting that humans have decided that they are very non-migratory, except that that's not what our history shows. Right. Migration continues to be a legacy that we live with today. So here's some examples. Athabascans uh, migrated from the northern region where most people who, who belong to the Athabascan cultural group continue to live. But you'll notice they made it down here into the center of the continent, into these coastal areas. Uh, these are actually not very far from us in Nevada. And then this area is actually the Navajo. And they use almost the same word to refer to themselves. So Dene of the Athabascan means the people. And Dine of the Navajo means the people. 
So they're culturally connected, but they have two very different ways of life here in the southwestern desert versus up here in the Arctic and subarctic. Um, as we mentioned earlier, Uto Aztecan language and Nahua le legends suggest migration from Mesoamerica, specifically towards the end of uh, the Aztecan Empire. And these are images from Aztec codices, very few of which survived the Spanish conquistadors, just to point out, these are super rare, uh, but they both point towards legends and histories of migration that almost predate the, the peak of the Aztec empire because there was certainly movement that happened before the conquistadors had arrived. Um, and even today, well, these are not quite today, but migration continued to be a way of life for many people throughout human history. And we'll talk about today still as well. Uh, but as recently as the 20th century, migration was a normal part of the Mexican-American relationship in which Mexican migrant workers were brought in through a perfectly legalized system uh, to do farm labor and then seasonally, and then they would return home to Mexico, and this would happen on a yearly basis. And then there were folks who ended up being migratory during the Depression because they had to because they were expelled from the places that they had hoped to occupy permanently and forced to become a part of caravans of workers looking for any kind of subsistence during the depression. Today, there are still nomadic peoples who uh, continue to pursue a movement uh, way of life, a movement-based way of life. Uh, some of the most well-known are the Berbers in North Africa. These are the folks who essentially occupy the Sahara Desert. They uh, they live in the shifting sands of the Sahara. That is not a place where permanent settlement can be built because they can also be buried. And so movement is the best way to live on that land. Um, the Romani in Europe and Central Asia are another culture of movement. Uh, they're popularly referred to as gypsy, but I think we should all be aware that gypsy is considered by the Romani to be a racial slur. So we're going to avoid the use of that term. And they have a long history of having a way of life that is nomadic, going back to time immemorial. And they continue that way of life through today, uh, which becomes an interesting source of conflict in European countries that are based around permanent settlement and national identities uh, that include the long-standing permanent occupiers of a country. For other folks, migration becomes a matter of survival. There are a lot of reasons why people need to leave their homelands in search of a better way of life elsewhere. Some of it is deeply traumatic. Some of it is war. Some of it is famine. Some of it is drought. Uh, we call folks who are leaving or who are fleeing danger and migrating, we call them refugees because they're seeking refuge outside of an unsafe homeland. And even today, the United Nations has adopted a universal declaration of human rights that includes a right to migration. So Article 13 of their declaration says everyone has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. That means nation state. Um, everyone has the right to leave any country, including his own, and to return to his country. And the next article, which I've only included the first section of uh, because it's relevant, it says everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. So we might need to think about our assumptions that migration and movement-based cultures are somehow not as civilized or not as valid as the cultures that we're a part of that are based on private property and permanence. So this is where we talk about the issue of presentism, and this is part of our knowledge practices and what we're thinking about in relationship to knowledge. Presentism is the attitude or the adherence to present day attitudes that imposes our present perspective onto non-modern, non-Western cultures 
right? So if we look at the past and we interpret everything in the pre-modern culture according to our values and our concepts, we're not really uh, giving it a chance to have its own meaning on its own terms. And the same applies to non-Western uh, cultures and knowledges. If we if we bring our Western perspective to those non-Western cultures and interpret their cultures according to our values and concepts, we're essentially performing colonialism. So this brings us to the issue of how the world is now. As, and when I say the world, I mean the Western, the globalized, westernized world that is based in a private property system of permanent settlement. Uh, how that world is now was not inevitable. There have been cultures of movement throughout history, throughout the entirety of human history. And so cultures of movement could have become the basis of our modern culture, but they didn't. Uh, how the world is now may not always cons be considered the best way to live by future generations. There may be generations that look back on our way of living and find it to be primitive, perhaps even ridiculous. Um, the way that we exist now is not the way it always was, not even in Europe, right? Remember, Europe was occupied by the Neanderthals. Um, and it's not the same for everyone. So it's not just that it was different in the past. It's that at any given time, it's not different or it's not the same for everyone all over the world. So would, another way to say that is that it was never universal, right? This was never the universal law about how human culture works or should work. And it is not permanent. If there's one thing that we have learned so far by studying most of our ancient cultures is that none of the, none of the cultures that we studied lasted forever, right? There were end dates on almost everybody's cultural analysis. And the cultures that didn't have the end date because they are continuing to this day, I'm thinking most particularly of the Austronesian cultures uh, who are now part of indigenous Australia and the, I might pronounce this incorrectly, the Kojans of South Africa, who are some of the oldest cultures on earth, who are part of the old, one of the oldest cultures on earth, and yet they continue to exist and practice their culture unchanged to this day right? That's two out of the whole world. So we know for sure that the way the world is now is not the way that it will always be. What is more, it may not be how we want it to stay. There are reasons for us to consider the question of whether a culture of permanent settlement continues to make sense. Right now, the world is literally on fire. These these photos from Australia are, are from early January, which is their summer. So they're not on fire right now. We are. Uh, and whenever we faced catastrophic natural disasters, even climate influenced ones, we end up asking the question of about rebuilding. Will these folks rebuild? Will they rebuild in the same place? And is it wise? What does it mean if we accept that some places may become uninhabitable and it may not be practical for people to rebuild their homes, right? California is the most populous state in our country. What happens if California becomes uninhabitable? What happens to all of the 40 million people who live there? By the way, the population of California is roughly equivalent to the population of Canada. So that's a whole country's worth of people. So it is worth questioning whether or not our current way of life is the way of life that best suits our world today. Uh, by 2050, which is not that far off when you think about it, uh, 30 years, there is a projected 150 to 200 million climate refugees, or there will be. Uh, and that's due to a number of things. Some areas may become uninhabitable due to increasingly violent hurricanes. So par large parts of the eastern United States, um, lots, lots of the eastern coast 
of Asia uh, and many islands, right? Uh, Madagascar, these would be typhoons technically in the Indian Ocean. Um, so lots of places are exposed to increasing hurricane violence. We've already seen that happen to New York City, to Houston, uh, to Puerto Rico. We've seen hurricane damage be almost ir uh, irrecoverable. And yet we went back and we rebuilt. And the question is, should we? Right. Is that is that a sustainable model of human society, of human life uh, for the future? These yellow areas are areas that are subject to desertification or drought. And you'll notice that there's a big swath here through the agricultural center of our continent. Um, this is just inside the Andes in South America. This is already a desert. This is already a desert. So the desertification has already happened there. Um, this is the Sahara up here. And this is actually rainforest, but the Sahara is moving south. It is encroaching upon the rainforest in Africa, upon the Congo in particular. Um, and the same thing is happening across several belts in uh, Central Asia and East Asia, including going right up over the Himalayas and into China. So there's a lot of desertification that we're going to expect around the world as the climate changes. And the last thing that we want to look at is rising sea levels, right? So we see islands, whole islands, whole nations will go underwater and not just islands, but deltas. So there are folks who are working on Egypt and parts of ancient Egypt have already been submerged where they were built in the Nile Delta. Um, Bangladesh and Bengal over here, both of these countries are entirely delta they will be 100% underwater with rising sea levels. Um, major ports in China and Southeast Asia will also be underwater. Like entire countries will disappear with rising sea levels. So where are all of those people going to go? That's a, <laughs> that was a sort of depressing question to leave you pondering. Uh, but to wrap up this lecture, I really want to encourage folks to think about what we consider to be normal, right? When we look at ancient cultures and we say, well, we should start with settlement and with agriculture, then we're excluding entire cultures, uh, not just histories, but existing current cultures today whose way of life is not built around agriculture. In fact, most of our ways of life aren't built around agriculture, even though they descended from cultures of agriculture and land use. How many of us still farm, right? So movement is a normal part of human existence. And maybe we need to be able to account for that in our assessment of human history. <laughs>